Hello, hello. Welcome to episode 24 of the Productive Wellbeing Show. I am so excited to be joined today by the amazing Lucy Brazier. And today we are having a conversation all about supporting your executives during the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. Now, Lucy is the CEO of um, Marcham Publishing. Is that how I say it? Sorry. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, it's also, Marcham. Um, She's also, uh, they they produce the Executive Secretary magazine. Lucy is an international speaker, and I'm so excited to have us have her with us because usually at this time of year, she would be on the other side of the world. Um, so Lucy, thank you so much for your time today and for being with us for this conversation. One thing before I sort of <laughs> let you speak, as you're joining us, guys, let us know where you're joining from. Um, say hi. If you're joining on the replay, say replay, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I've got 11 o'clock meetings. I can't join this. Um, if you've got any questions, leave them. I can see you all there on LinkedIn. Um, and I feel like I feel like I'm on an aeroplane, Lucy. And the fire exits <laughs> and the escape exits. <laughs> oh, there we go. So welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really, really wonderful to be here this morning. It's um, it's the beginning of Administrative Professionals Week. It's in the States, the biggest festival celebrating administrative assistance and um, all the varying titles around that that there is in the world. And usually at this time of the year, I'm in the middle of a three week tour. So it's very strange sitting at home. But we're going to see what we can do to try and support the assistance through this week. Yeah, crazy, crazy times for everybody. Oh, Dinah's on on um, Facebook. Oh, Dinah. Dinah. Um, I'm feeling better, my dear. She wasn't feeling very well this morning, poor thing. Oh, bless. Um, Dinah's going to be on the show at the end of the week on Friday. I'm so excited. She's going to be my Friday guest. Fantastic. Um, right, Lucy, let's have a chat about this. Now, this conversation is really long. We haven't got a huge amount of time. So let's talk about three things then that you would be recommending that these assistants can um, think about when it comes to supporting their executives during this crisis and beyond, because the world is never going to be the same again. So what is sort of top tips for them to help them to really um, come out of this and rise in their career and as people? I think there are several things um, and it ties into things that we were saying before we even got into this crisis. So let's rewind very, very slightly, shall we? Because when I started the magazine, we were in the middle of recession. And at that point, they got given all sorts of work to do that was previously middle management, but the middle management had been let go and therefore they were asked to do that stuff. And they picked it up, usually with no training and certainly for no more money. So let's roll forward. Um, and I would say that most executives really have no clue how to use their assistant in the first place. So the odd one, yes, and maybe that one-to-one -one relationship works, but a lot of them have never had any training in how to use an assistant. They just get given them and then the two of you are floundering somewhat because the assistant very rarely will speak up and talk about exactly what it is that they are able to do for their executive. Now, in this situation, it makes it even more imperative that the assistant really gets to grips with what they are able to do for the executive. Because let's think about the executive for a second here, okay? They are also in a situation where they have never been here before. This is not something that, a situation that they are used to either. And I would suspect that a lot of them are flying by the seat of their pants. They will be in endless Zoom meetings. There will be a level of panic they will be trying to do what's right big picture wise for all of their staff, for their company. It is a situation that is unprecedented. So when the assistant calls them and says, I'm running short of things to do, what would you like me to do for you? That is absolutely not where their head is at. Where their head is at is this whole big picture thing. That isn't to say that you're not of use. It's just they can't take their head away from over here and move it into the smaller picture stuff because otherwise they're taking that way off the ball. So here is the thing. Assistants are amazing at taming chaos. 
they are forever taking emergencies or problems or things that require you to go down into the detail and turning that into something actionable. I know that when Matt and I are working together, Matt's my assistant, um, you know, I will say, wow, I've got this really amazing idea. And he goes, mm, OK, because he knows he's going to have to take it and turn it into something granular that actually works and put the process in place. So you are extraordinary at that stuff. The process and procedures and detail. I couldn't do detail if my life depended on it. I'm great at ideas and driving things forward, but I really can't get into that level. So actually for your executives, how amazing to have somebody there who actually can take away all that big picture stuff and start to put systems in place to really make it work. What new procedures does your new, does your new situation within the business need? What new processes need to be put in place? Is there research that you could be doing for your executive that you really feel that would benefit if you were doing background stuff for them and feeding into the bigger picture? So what I would say is my very first point is probably to seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Um, I've kept talking about the fact over the last few years that AI is coming artificial intelligence and that actually in order to remain relevant, you need to start to really understand your businesses because what's going to happen when AI kicks in is that all the task-based stuff, all the reactive stuff is going to go out the window, is going to be taken over by machines. This situation has only accelerated that. And you don't want to be in a situation where you are, well, <laughs> to use an analogy, where you're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic rather than helping man the lifeboats, you know? Um, and a lot of you have said to me over the last couple of weeks, I am really, really scared about what happens when I go back to work because I don't think I'm adding value and they're not telling me what I need to do in order to add value. Stop asking what you need to do to add value and work it out and go and present it to them. Ask the right questions. Communication is key at this point. Being able to be helpful and make them feel like you are somebody that they can rely on. I was saying to somebody um, over the weekend, actually, it's almost like you're sitting in the same office side by side and your exec has got a pile of papers like this. And that pile of papers, every single one of them has got a list of things that need to be done on it. And if you sit next to them and you take the papers away from them one at a time and look at them and hand them back the things that only they can do, but maybe take two or three points off each piece of paper that you can do in the background, just think. You know, you're probably giving them back 50% of their time just by spending 10 minutes a day working out how you can help them. You know, I think, um, yeah, so that's my first point, really, seeking first to understand before you try and be understood. Mm. Then <laughs> the second thing I would say is probably to um, know what your worth is. So you've always wanted to sit and rework what your job description is, I would have thought, because most of you have got job descriptions that bear absolutely no relation at all to what you're really doing. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to go and look at the things that you have been doing that really add value to your exec. So maybe um, sit and write a list of all the things that you are currently doing, but also the things that you would really like to be doing because this is an opportunity to step up and start doing some of those as well. And for some of you, that will be as basic as maybe taking on emails where you haven't been allowed to before or taking on calendar management or you know any of these things that um, you know, your execs say, oh, you know, don't worry about that. I would much rather do that myself. Uh, if you are taking those things from them, you can free up easily half their time just by having a system in place which helps them to triage so that they're only dealing with the most important things um, but you know all sorts of other things as well as I said it could be that you decide that you're going to help them to do briefing documents on things and really ask them what are your priorities this week what are the things that you feel I could really be helping with what are the things that you hate doing that I could take off your plate at the moment whilst we're in the middle of this crisis so that you can concentrate on that big picture stuff? You know, 
maybe start asking them about what their pain points are. What are the things that um, you know really cause you a problem or that are taking up lots of your time that maybe I could be doing some of the detail work in? Are there things you're particularly worried about that I could be helping with? Who's chasing things for them? If they've given people projects to do or things to look at, could you be chasing those people up on their um, behalf? So there's a myriad of things that actually you could be helping them with in order to make them more effective. And if you start adding those to your job description, maybe go to Julie Perrine's website, allthingsadmin.com. She has a great template there, which in five minutes a day will allow you to rewrite your job description so that when you come out the other end of this, you've got something really useful to say, this is what I do, and this is how I helped you through this. Start noting down examples. And that also massively helps with things like imposter syndrome as well, doesn't it? Because once you know what you're bringing to the table, then how can you feel like you're an imposter, like you're not good enough, like you can't do it? You've got the proof. Yes, Abigail. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because assistants are forever saying to me, oh, Lucy, I would love to be able to do that. But, you know, my business only lets me do that or lets the people do that that contribute to the bottom line. And the problem is that assistants don't really understand that they do contribute to the bottom line all the time. And if you sit and you do the math, if you work out how many hours you save your executive a week, and then you look at how much they're paid and times one by the other, that is how much you contribute to the bottom line. And that's before they spent that time that you have saved them going away and saving the world in this situation, maybe the business or putting deals in place or going on meetings that are going to create more money for the business. If you get this right, not only will you contribute to the bottom line, but you will be absolutely invaluable to the business because the business right now needs those execs focused on the future and not focused on the detail. Yeah, amazing. And the third point then is? Oh, my third point is to be proactive. Be proactive. I think we are very good at sitting, waiting to be told what to do. Time for that is really gone from every angle. The modern assistant, as I kept saying, even before this crisis came into place, was one who was a strategic business partner. And what did I mean by that? Well, you have your executive who has very, very key strengths. We, um, I, I quite often when I'm training talk about Meredith Belbin, which is a psychometric testing system. And what Belbin says is where um, people work best in a team. And it's very interesting because the three characteristics of an assistant are totally different on the whole when you do the testings to the ones that are for the executives. So the executives are there coming up with brand new revenue streams, leading from the front, getting everybody to follow them, um, making sure that that whole big picture thing is happening. But the assistants are great at dotting the I's and crossing the T's and making sure the processes are in place and making sure that the team is working well together and that everybody understands how it's happening and that if the executive is maybe slightly off kilter, that everybody is still OK and functioning properly. So on the one hand, you have your executive's world on one side and on the other side, you've got the assistant's world. But when you meet in the middle, it actually makes one amazing person that is really useful to the business because you have both sides of the coin. It's like one of you breathes in and the other one breathes out. And I think it's so important that the assistant understands that they are employed by the business to do what they do, not by their executive. So if the executive is saying, really don't want you to do that, I'm quite happy doing that. You really should be thinking about it. There's, there's a great story to illustrate this actually, um, Abigail. There's a guy I work with a lot who is, um, He's the guy who founded Priceline and Booking.com. Mm -hmm. And he says that if your executive um, is doing stuff like that, like the calendar and so on, then actually <laughs> they are paying their assistant. So if you don't have an assistant, you are an assistant. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. Je so Jeff always says, you know, <laughs> Why are you paying yourself as an, an executive? Why is the company paying the executive maybe $100 an hour 
in order to do tasks that an assistant could be doing for 30 or 40. It makes absolutely no sense. So really, if the business is getting the most value out of you as an assistant and out of the executive, you need to be taking that stuff off them. And just remind me again, because I've seen you speak at events before. You're an amazing speaker. There was a statistic that you gave in one of the talks that you did last year where you talked about the average age that a manager gets management training. And it absolutely blew my mind because I think if coming back to your number one point, seek first to understand, if we don't understand that these managers haven't necessarily been taught how to manage people and to work with their teams and to work with their assistants and to work even with other people in their teams that's kind of where some of the problem comes up right what was that average age was it something like 40 yeah it's 42 is the average age that somebody is before they get training on how to manage other people that's a whole heap of executives walking around without a clue what they're doing yeah. and you know i think with the, I know personally, the first time I got an assistant, I sat there and I thought, oh, I've got an assistant. And it's a status symbol. It isn't because, you know, you really understand what they can do for you. And so Elizabeth, or Bob, as she liked to be called, um, I, <laughs> I sat down with and I was trying to be managerial. And I said, so, Bob, I think that what you could do for me currently is this and this and this. And she came aside and said, well, no, that isn't what I do. And I said, oh, OK, well, maybe we could look at you doing this and this and this. And she said, no, look, why don't I just talk you through how this is going to work? And she did. And actually, part of the reason I'm so successful is because I had Bob for, oh, gosh, she came with me to three companies after that, I think, because we worked so well together. And then she went back to New Zealand, where she's from, to Wellington, because her father wasn't very well. And um when I started the business, I took Matt on board. But, you know, having a really amazing assistant for me as a CEO just means that I can get on with doing the things that I'm great at. And I know that if I say to Matt, this needs doing, or if he comes and says, what, you know, would you like me to do? And I explain, then I don't have to think about that again. It's done. It's, mm. it, I don't have to check up. It just happens. Now, you think about that from a point of view of a pot of time, because my day is finite. However successful we are, there are still only 24 hours in a day, right? So actually, having an assistant that really understands how you tick and understands where they can fill in the jigsaw puzzle pieces where you are not so strong basically means that I've almost got a stunt double. Yeah, and I think my analogy in all of it is like really stay in your lane imagine that you're a racehorse know what your skills are and run that race and it, like most of the team sports you can't be the the person setting up the the goal the strike and the kicker you need you need one person to set it up and the other person to kick it in and no one is better than the other but without the person setting things up you can't get all of this stuff done so, yeah, it really is a team. Teamwork makes that dream work. <laughs> it is, but it's also about the whole protection thing and knowing that I can just get on with doing what I'm doing. You know, even down to booking those um, meetings in the calendar, I always just say, don't speak to me. You know, I love I love um, to come and talk to you on your show or I'd love to have that meeting with you or whatever because that's my brand. So I always say, yes, I'd love to do that. But don't think I'm being grand. You absolutely must speak to my assistant because he will kill me if I start putting things in the calendar because he's always got so many other things penciled in. Well, that is the truth. But the other side of that truth is that when I forward that email to him, I put a number at the bottom between one and five. And if it's a one, I will be having a meeting with you probably within 10 minutes. It, it's a five. It will be a cold day in hell before you get a meeting with me. Now, Thank goodness I was a one. <laughs> Well, exactly. Maybe I was a two. We don't know. <laughs> no, but what it does is it means that it's very easy for the two of us to understand. It takes that whole communication piece out between the two of us. It means he can just get on and do his job and we don't have to keep going backwards and forwards on it. So maybe sit and look for systems like that where it's going to take time out of things, you know, or with email, we have five folders. So we have a folder that says today we have which into which everything goes that I need to deal with today. 
we have a folder which is um, this week, and although it isn't all this week, it's stuff that I could I need to respond to, and he'll move stuff from that folder up into today on a daily basis. I've got a Matt has dealt with, um, which is everything that he's answered on my behalf or people who've asked for brochures or whatever it happens to be. Then there's a um, for your information, which is stuff that I have to read, but I don't necessarily need to respond to. And finally, there's a to be deleted, which is great because I just sit there and go delete, 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 delete. And it's great for the endorphins. Um, but occasionally he's missed something. So very occasionally. But what it means is that I can totally rest assured that nothing is disappearing that I need. But equally, I know that if I go to today, I've dealt with everything that is urgent. And right now, you know, we're a tiny business. We always live hand to mouth. Um, we're obviously trying to generate income to keep everybody going as much as everything else, any other company is, you know. So to know that on a daily basis, I just have to spend 12% of my time going to that one folder and dealing with those emails in there, as opposed to 58% of my time, which is how much time an executive spends on average on email, is huge. Mm. It's huge. That's why I'm saying sometimes taking those basic things away is wonderful. And if you relate it back to money, what business wants to spend 58% of the salary of their exec on them <laughs> doing email for them? It's crazy. Yeah. And um, just coming briefly going to touch on something that we spoke about before we started. Um, so some people might be finding themselves at the moment furloughed as a result of what's going mm. on. And we were just talking about how this is although it's tough and it's a change and it's something to get your head around, et cetera, et cetera, it, it, it's a lemon, but how can we make lemonade out of this? It is a brilliant opportunity for people to invest in, uh, invest their time in training to, to analyze what, um, what skill set they've got to. So Lucy's mentioned a huge number of different things that you can do, and all of them are amazing, but each of them is sort of a learning, a, a training in itself. And this, I guess, is what you would be attending when you would be seeing Lucy and all of her colleagues. A few, Quite a few of you are on um, today. We've got Kathleen Drum, Jenny Churcher, um, Maria Jose uh, from, from Spain. So it is a brilliant opportunity, isn't it, for people to actually go and learn things like how to prioritize your your inbox and these top tips and tricks and strategies for absolutely and i think it's interesting that um the uk government has chosen to say we will pay 80 percent of salaries but people are not allowed to work um <laughs> by the way uh you know if you are a business owner you still have to pay those salaries and claim them back so that's why you're seeing the odd company who is choosing to let people go as opposed to furlough them because they simply don't have the cash flow to pay that salary in the first mm. place but I think what's interesting about the British furloughing is that they are saying you can't work but you are still allowed to train so it is a situation whereby you are able to go and take some of those courses yes and upskill yourself maybe learn more about your business as well because I think there's a great deal of difference between knowing and understanding and I think most assistants know a lot about their business but don't really understand it and I think especially as we move forward being able to understand where you can add value and why that's important becomes increasingly important so mm -hmm. maybe go read some of the reports you've been putting off reading or read through sent items if you have access to the email, whatever. That's where Matt says he gets most of his information from, from reading my sent items. <laughs> Amazing. And just one sort of final thing to touch on, I guess, is that um, once the lockdowns are over, then people are going to be going back to work. So kind of understanding that even if you are furloughed or even if um, you've not got a lot of work to do right now, there is going to come the next step, the next phase, and not to be sort of dramatic and scary, but the next phase where it's going to serve you to have spent some time understanding a little bit more about your business so that you are going back in to the next stage where, you know, the economy isn't going to be great um, so that you can actually really justify. Let me be brutal. Let me be brutal. You know, we are looking at a situation um, I was reading yesterday where possibly a third of workers will have, be out of work. I mean, we're going into a situation 
which is going to be as bad, if not worse, as the Great Depression, according to the press. So who are going to be the people that stay and who are going to be the people that go? Mm. Well, to me, very definitely, even more than ever, you need to be proving what your return on investment is to the business. And you need to be using this time to prove how indispensable you are to your executive. As long as you're doing that, I can't see that there will be a problem. Mm. And yeah, and it's amazing to be on all these social platforms catching up with everybody. But the wave will catch you if you're not. It's always best to be, <laughs> to be prepared, be one step ahead of, of anything. And so educating yourself is always has always been my way. And maybe that's been yours in your career. That's the thing that's helped me stay ahead of everybody else is never chilling while everybody's chilling. Yes, it's, it's about being innovative and it's about working your way out of it. Having said that, um, what I will say is that this week we're running a campaign, which is for Administrative Professionals Week, where we are putting the tools in place for you to have those conversations with your exec. If you are worried about how to do that, because it isn't familiar with you, to you. So um, we are publishing an ebook tomorrow with all sorts of skill sets in it about communication and being proactive and how you do that stuff. Wednesday, there is an open letter going out um, all over social media and which we're sending out to our newsletter list, which you can then forward to your exec and say, hey, look at this. They're explaining exactly how you can I best use me over this crisis to make sure that you're freeing up your time. And I am also doing a 10 minute film on Thursday, which, again, they can forward to their execs that says this is how you do it. This is how you use your assistant in 10 minutes a day to give you back 50 percent of your time. So follow, <laughs> follow along. <laughs> have a look. And, um, hopefully you'll get some very useful tools. Oh, and the other thing is that I was trying for ages before I came online today to get it to work because um, I, it isn't. 100% yet, but it will be by the time we release it later this week. We have a virtual background that you can use on Zoom and on uh, Microsoft Teams, which has got help us help you in the background as well as a very smart office background in the hopes that your execs will say, help us help you. What does that mean? And that means you can then start the conversation that way. Fantastic. Well, Lucy, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody who's joined us live. Um, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments and Lucy and I will get to them um, after this. Uh, if uh, you're joining on replay, let us know. That's That would be awesome. Um, Lucy, where can we go to find out more about you? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm all over social media. So if you look up Lucy Brazier on any of the social media, you'll find me there. Um, the website is www.executivesecretary.com and Facebook group is Executive Secretary Magazine. That's where most of the conversation happens. Amazing. And we'll put those links in the comments afterwards as well. Um, so, guys, Thank you for your time with us today, Lucy. Thank you for your time. It's been awesome, as I said, to have this conversation. And I can't wait to hear what your top takeaways have been from it, because Lucy has dropped so many. Um, I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow at 11. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and don't forget to wash your hands.